Please turn your Bibles to Galatians chapter 6. And, um, well, we finally come to the end of that journey. End of chapter 6 here, this last few uh, nine verses we're going to be dealing with. And uh, just so you know, next week we're going to begin uh, another sermon series and we're just going to go right to the book of Ephesians right next door. So you can go home this week and read through it. It takes about 10 minutes to read through that, that, that uh, letter and uh, you can be ready for that series starting next week. There's a French po proverb that goes like this. Quote, Always talk big and you will never be forgotten. Someone else said this, quote, People who think they know it all are really annoying, are really annoying those of us who do. <laughs> so I want you to imagine with me um, social media as a person. The social media applications as a person. So we, ha we can have this following dialogue. Wikipedia, I know everything. Google, I have everything. Facebook, I know everybody. Internet, without me, you, you are all nothing. And then electricity comes along and says, keep talking, click. <laughs> and finally, there's boxer Muhammad Ali. I don't know if you guys remember who that was. He's no longer with us. Muhammad Ali once said, it's not bragging if you can back it up. Dictionary.com defines the word boast and in, in a sense without an object is this, quote, to speak with exaggeration or excessive pride, especially about oneself. And the same verb boast with an object in the negative sense is defined in this way, to speak of with excessive pride and vanity. And in the positive sense, to be proud in the possession. Pastor Jonathan Parnell in his article, really wonderful article, Learning How to Boast, asks two, two important questions. Question one, what is it about us humans that makes us care so much about our own glory? Question two, why is this glory chasing so common throughout history the history of mankind. When we look at the New Testament, we see the Apostle Paul there. He wrote two letters to the church at Corinth. We know there was another letter that we don't have. And Corinth uh, was a situated, that church was situated in a glory chasing culture. I'm using Purnell's uh, uh, caption there, glory chasing. It was a city situated, a church situated in the city of Corinth a diverse uh, culture of Roman and Greek influences, a city that uh, the Parnell defines as full of, quote, mean monsters who love to rank one another and snubbed those who appeared pathetic. Now, the church in the midst of Corinth, as you read in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, was no doubt influenced by these glory-chasing citizens of Corinth. Paul, in defense of his ministry, in the defense of his ministry in 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, uh, is accused of being a glory chasing apostle by influencers within the church itself. But Paul said this in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. He said, But we will not boast beyond limits, but will boast only with regard to the area of influence God assigned to us to reach even. To you. And later on in, the, in verse 17 and 18, he said this Let the one who boasts boast in the Lord. For it is not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. So here we are at the end of Galatians chapter 6. And uh, we're going to pick it up at the 11th verse right to the end. So let's read this together. Galatians 6, chapter, chapter 6, verse 11. See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised, and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. 
For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. Verse 14, But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor, under, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. But as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray together. Lord, thank you for this time that we've had in Galatians since January. Week by week, verse by verse, looking at this ancient letter and, and the implications for it for us. I pray, Lord, that we would not forget those things that you have taught us by your Spirit, how you've maybe even changed us and molded us and shaped us. And as we look at these last few verses, Lord, we ask that you would help us to continue that way, to trust you by your Spirit that the Word of God is inspired and authoritative and will not come back empty. So we accept that, Lord. I pray that you would set me aside and that your message would be loud and clear. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So today we're wrapping up our series, as I've already mentioned in, in Galatians. For me, it's, it's quite a bittersweet time. See, going through this letter, verse by verse, studying and reading about uh, commentaries on it, and all those things that I, that I get to do, and that you could do too, has been a great blessing and, and a challenge. Because it never ceases to amaze me the impact that the God's Word can have in our lives. It's quite amazing. And I hope it's been a blessing to you as well, and I hope it's also been a challenge as well. And my intent this morning is not to go through, uh, uh, you know, over all the details in depth that we've discovered in Paul's letter to the Galatians since we started. Because you and I are more, more than capable of going back over this letter on our own and reading through it and applying those things that we already learned and understood, principles and commands that God has given to us in this letter. And by the way, should we not always be quote-unquote in the Bible? As we unpack 11, uh, verse 11 to 18, in the essence, I guess, the core message of Paul's letter that is found in this letter is right here for us in these nine verses as he summarizes his letter for us. He says here that he's done this with my own hand, verse 11. And I, I think this is a noteworthy place to start uh, here with this statement. There's no contention here, there's no concern here, but it's something that maybe we don't understand because it was normal for Paul to use a secretary to write his letters. Those letters were not written by Paul, most of them. They were written by a secretary. So, um, why then would he write the closing comments in his own hands? Well, one commentator, uh, commentary suggests that Paul does this to validate for the Galatian believers the contents of his letter, and I would agree with that. And Paul does this in a number of other letters. If you check out 1 Corinthians chapter 16, uh, Colossians chapter 4, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, and Philemon verse 19, you see Paul writing in his, he's saying, I'm writing in my own hand here. But there's a purpose I'm saying this to you, because there's more than just validating to the Galatians that this was important. It's it was written here, I believe, to validate and to underscore the importance of his comments that we are summarizing here today. Because this is actually the key point of his whole letter. It's right here. He's, he summarizes it. He's a good uh, paper writer. I used to write papers in, in seminary and secondary school. You start with a, you know, a thesis, you have a body, and you summarize and conclude. And he's doing that here. And that's important for us to understand that. It's interesting when you study the Bible, when you see things like this, we often just kind of zoom by. And that's okay. But if you just dug a little deeper into it, if you spent some time there, he, God didn't uh, 
um, have an accident here. He, Paul put that intentionally there. So let's look at verse 12 and 13 together. And we see the reason really here for why he wrote to the churches in Galatia. Remember, as we've said a number of times, false teachers known as Judaizers, these were Jew Jewish, Jewish uh, folks, had begun to make some inroads in the churches that Paul had planted in Galatia. He planted at least five churches that we know of there. But there's a couple of points that we need to have in our, in our, uh, in our, in our back pocket. Point number one. Oh, that's sweet. I need some water. Point number one. When you think about the church in its early years, such as the time of Paul here, uh, the key opponents of the church in the early years were the religious Jewish leaders. Uh, uh, locally and nationally to the claims of Christ and his people and his apostles. Paul, remember here in this letter, get himself would give testimony to his very earnest and zealous endeavors. He was zealous to persecute the church. Do you remember that? Prior to his encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus. Point number two. As the church moved beyond the walls of Jerusalem, which it did rather quickly, as they moved beyond the walls of Jerusalem, the early Christians would encounter further resistance from uh, and pushback from Jewish communities as they went into those communities and their leadership throughout the Roman Empire. We also need to keep in mind that the pagan culture itself, the Roman Empire, the culture of the Roman Empire would also participate in occasional cultural and sometimes even official persecution of the church as well. All this to say, that's why this is important, Paul's concern was with the Judaizers who seemed to have made some inroads into the churches where they were teaching, their false teaching. So the question is that you need to ask yourself is, what were the Judaizers teaching that Paul was obviously all worked out about? He got so worked up, you remember the story here at the beginning? Uh, he got so worked up about it, he describes an encounter he had with the Apostle Peter in chapter 2 of Galatians. Chapter 2 describes the Judaizers as what? Certain men who belong to the circumcision party. That's in chapter 2, verse 12. And it's interesting when you read that story until Peter, until they showed up, Peter was okay to have lunch with the Gentile believers. It was okay for Peter to sit down and have coffee with you and me. That is, until he heard that certain men belonging to the circumcision party had arrived. Then Peter, we are told, drew back and separated himself. Here was the apostle, Apostle Peter, who had walked with Jesus for three years. Witnessed all that Jesus had done. He had, was an eyewitness of Jesus' resurrection and ascension into heaven. And when he had finished preaching to the Jewish crowds on the day of Pentecost, 3,000, 3,000 came to Christ and were baptized. Yet here he is separating himself from the Gentile brothers and sisters in Christ. Peter's hypocrisy, certainly, as we read in the text, leading others astray as well. And Paul gets right up in his mug and he says, you know what? You're leading people astray from the truth of the gospel. Chapter 2, verse 14. So that's the reason that Paul is so bewildered in this letter. So astonished, it says in the first chapter. So but he just doesn't understand that the Galatians would be turning to a different gospel, which Paul even tells us in chapter 1, is no such thing. So in a nutshell, the Judaizers were teaching that the Gentile believers needed to adopt the Mosaic law, including circumcision, for all the male Gentile believers, along with their faith in Christ. In order to be what? Forgiven and saved for their, from their sin. Now, we're not talking about how we should navigate the Mosaic Law now. But this is what they were, they were saying. Jesus plus, plus, plus. To be saved. Jesus plus, plus, plus. I want us to think through this. 
And I, I would venture to say that anyone in here or anyone who spends a measure of time uh, studying the doctrine of salvation as described by the New Testament, as proclaimed by Jesus Christ in all four Gospels, and even if you look in the Old Testament, it describes the way of salvation for you and me, that that person would have no problem realizing that these Judaizers were false teachers. Then how come some people were believing him? Believing them. Uh, John Stott in his commentary asks a very important question that is relevant to this time that we're studying this, these verses. Question, or uh, quote, question. Is the essence of the Christian religion outward or inward? Is the essence, when you boil it all down, is the Christian religion outward or inward? It is, a, is it a religion of external ceremonies or something inward? And there is the new preacher of the day. Come on up. <laughs> run, run, run. Yeah. Where was I? Okay. Is Christianity a religion of external ceremonies or something inward? And let's turn this question around and ask yourself, what would you think the Judaizers would answer how would they answer the same question? Well, take a look at the text and we see Paul challenging the Judaizers' doctrine by addressing their motivations. Here's one of their motivations in verse 13. That was a desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. That was one of their motivations. See, the Judaizers were denying that salvation was by faith alone. They were denying that, and that circumcision was required for salvation. This is what it was happening there. In effect, this is what Par Parnell was calling in his article that I mentioned earlier, glory chasing. Glory chasing. See, Parnell's thesis is that all people, you and me, even these Judaizers of Paul's day, are created by God in his image and likeness. Are we not? Genesis 1, verse 26 to 28. That human beings have been set apart from every other creature on this planet. We're uniquely created, men and women, to reflect God's majesty and glory and worth. That's why we were created. This means that we should consider some questions as made in the image and likeness of God. Who are we, God? Who are we, God? Well, the psalmist in Psalm 8, verse 3 and 8, asks the same question, just differently. What is man that you're mindful of him? What is man that you're mindful of him? And then he goes on to say, Yet you have made him a little, little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. God has done that. Whether we recognize this or not, whether we are aware of it or not, whether we believe this or not, whether we find our fulfillment in this or not, glory chasing is innate within us. Follow through on this. Please notice the word boast here in the text. Verse 13 and 14. Boast in 13 and 14. The original meaning is to glory. Is to glory. That's what it means to boast. To glory. The Judaizers then in one sense were only doing what they were made to do. To glory. However, in their glory chasing, the Judaizers were designing, as Paul said, to boast in what? In your flesh. In other words, to glorify human effort to attain salvation. To glory in self instead of reflecting the majesty and glory of the one and only God who created them. To reflect his glory and honor. It's interesting, an actor once said this. 
I think my biggest problem was, as a celebrity on a TV show, you get an inflated ego, more off, get an inflated ego and think you're the center of the universe. We all have an ego. It's in us. It's part of our psyche, part of our psychology. And an inflated ego, more often than not, is, is rooted in the, what the Bible calls self-righteousness. Self-righteousness. My friends, be honest. All of us have an inflated view of ourselves more often than we realize. All of us. We all have a more inflated ego than we should from time to time. Let's go to Luke's Gospel, chapter 18. You can flip over there. There we find the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Maybe you remember that one. And Jesus there tells a story of two men going to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. If you don't know what it meant to be a tax collector in the first century, well, you were the scum of the earth. You were the greatest sinner that ever existed. And maybe some of them were. Anyways, it's the story, the parable of the Pharisee and the other tax collector. And the Pharisee goes off by himself to pray and he says this, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, and even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. Luke 18, 11, and 12. The tax collector was standing far off from the Pharisee because they would never associate, lifted up his eyes to heaven, beat his breast and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus made some comments about that. He said, I tell you this, I tell you, this man, that's the tax collector, went down to his house justified rather than the other one. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Paul put it this way in his Roman letter, chapter 12, verse 3 and 5. Paul said, For the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. So, that's the difference between glory chasing and glorifying God. You know, I don't know if you noticed, we skipped by a, a statement. And we need to go back there. Of course, the motivation of the Juda Judaizer was their own self-glory as opposed to glorifying God. Absolutely it was. But Paul gives us another reason. And what was that reason? It was to force circumcision onto the Gentile believers. Force it. Let's read verse 13. In order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. Here's the other reason that they were doing this. So that they would not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. And you're asking yourself, how did Paul come to that conclusion? Well, there's lots of evidence for that. The first part of verse 13. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law. Did you know that when you made that covenant and, you, and it was an outward sign, the circumcision, for the male uh, Gentile believers or Jewish it meant you had to keep every point of the law perfectly. Perfectly. That was the requirement in the covenant, is to keep the law. And circumcision was a sign of that covenant. But by not keeping the law perfectly, the Judaizers were in essence admitting that they knew salvation could not be earned by keeping the law. So Paul really calls their bluff here. He, he really flips the charts on them because he saw through their story. They didn't believe it either. And Paul makes this point in chapter 5 here of Galatians. If I, that is Paul, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? 5.11 if I preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? Because they accused them of preaching circumcision. This brings us to a, 
obvious reality in the Christian walk. Now let me ask you, why is the cross so offensive to the world? Why is the cross so offensive to the world? Think about that. Why is the cross so offensive to our families and friends? Why is the cross so offensive to even some who call themselves Christians today? They're offended by it. You know, the Judaizers, I can't prove it, but they knew they couldn't be saved by keeping the law. But they persisted in trying to save themselves by keeping some rules. There's this funny thing, no terrible popular idea that's been around, I think, forever. That if I do enough good things, it will at least balance out the bad things and that should get me a boarding pass on the bus to heaven. Or the idea that if I go to church enough, that I serve enough, that I do enough, that God that I give enough that God will give me that boarding pass on the bus to heaven. My friends, the reason the cross is so offensive because it points to some of the hard truths about ourselves. It's like looking in a mirror when you look at a cross. Paul would put it this way in chapter 3, verse 10. Because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. In other words, no one will be justified before a holy and righteous God by the works of the law. The cross is offensive because as someone said, quote, every time you look at the cross, Christ seems to say, I am here because of you. It is your sin I am bearing, your curse I am suffering, your debt I am paying, your death I am dying. We don't like looking at the cross and discovering our actual size. How really big we are in the sight of God. We don't like it. We don't like the humiliation that it represents. We don't like seeing ourselves as God sees us as we really are. So what do we do? We steer clear of the crucified Christ. We don't want to talk about that. People don't like it. It's too rough. We create a Christianity that says we are okay just the way we are. You know that song, Come As You Are? I don't like it. I know the reason for it. Don't get me wrong. Don't get on my grill here because you're Billy Graham. I love Billy Graham. We, we just say, well, we're just good the way we are, Lord. Take us the way we are. We contrive and create all sorts of ways and means to uh, satisfy that glory chasing that we were actually innately created to seek, but not in ourselves. we got a Christianity now that says, listen, I can help you, clean you up a little bit, and send you out and you'll have your best life now. If you believe that, that is your best life now. It's not happening that way. That's what Paul is saying here. We create a religion that is all things to all people, which means nothing, and avoids all any faith in the crucified Christ. We do this and we do that. We work really hard here and hey, you're in like Flint. Problem. And then, when you have someone stand up, maybe in a platform like this, or you do that in your own life, that preaches the crucified Christ, what happens? You're shunned, you're laughed at, you're canceled. You're persecuted in some places to the extent of your own life. Friends, we were created, as the psalmist said, with glory and honor. Created to reflect the glory of God in and through our lives. It's like we're holding up a mirror. The Galatian believers fully understood this. I know they did. 
I can't prove it. They're not here. Let's talk to them in heaven when we get there. Uh, Galatian believers understood this all too well when they put their faith and their trust in the crucified Christ. And this was a centerpiece. If you look at Paul's life and ministry, it was a centerpiece of his life. For he tells us here in verse 14, Be far, but far be it for me to boast, to glory, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, when Paul went to Corinth, we'll go back there, he said to the believers that he did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. Apparently history tells us he was a terrible orator. I, I, don't, I don't have a problem. I have a problem with that too. Not with great speeches did he go. Not with human wisdom did Paul arrive. But he said this in 1 Corinthians 2 too. He decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's all he wanted to know. Because he knew that changes lives. That changes lives. In his Roman letter, in Romans 6.6, 6, uh, he's speaking of the, our union with Christ. Our union with Christ. When you become a believer, you're united with Christ. He says this, We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. And the Galatian believers in the confession of the crucified Christ that died to sin and Romans 6.11 tells us that they were made alive to God in Christ Jesus. They were going back to the graveyard for them, Paul said. Don't go back there, hang out with the dead. That would produce nothing of eternal lasting value in your life. Friends, we have a choice to make today. Boast in ourselves or boast in the cross. There is no middle ground at the foot of the cross. There is no middle ground. I'm going to share a story to close off this sermon series from our brother, uh, some sisters of ours, Christian believers from long ago, who were like Paul, boasting in the cross, in the crucified Christ. Let me just read this to you. Perpuchia, uh, Perpuchia, I can't even say that name, bravely held Felicity in her arms, anticipating their death together as sisters in Christ. The bull's horns had already wounded Felicity, and the crowd wanted to, the coup de grace, the, the coup de grace. Then, abruptly and inexplicably, explicably, the bull stood still. The crowd hushed. This animal was not following a script. Now the crowds let loose with demands for blood, and the gladiator, glad, gladiators rushed forward to finish the work. Felicity died quickly. When Perpetua executioner hesitated, she herself helped guide her bl this blade into her body. The Colossian, the Colosseum had never before seen such a spectacle. Perpetua came from a wealthy family. Her father was a pagan, but her mother and brothers were Christians. Perpetua had a nursing baby at the time of her arrest for confessing Christ. Her father urged her to renounce faith for his sake and for her family. Even Roman authorities urged her to offer a simple sacrifice to Roman power. She refused. She would not renounce Christ as Lord, claiming that the name that belonged to her was the name of a Christian. Felicity was a slave and pregnant. Since Roman law prohibited the execution of pregnant women, sentence was delayed. Felicity gave birth in prison to a baby girl that would be adopted by Christians. When prison guards wondered how she would handle facing beasts in the arena, especially so soon after her child's birth, she responded, Now my sufferings are only mine. But when I face the beasts, there will be another who will live in me and will suffer for me since I shall be suffering for him. Then there's ba Balandina. A slave girl was the last to die. She was hanged from a post and exposed to wild animals. But they would not attack. She was repeatedly tortured and eventually trapped in a net and trampled by a bull. All the mar martyrs, bar martyrs' bodies were left unburied and guarded by soldiers. Such courage made a mark on the Romans. These three women and Christians had stood together and died together. Several spectators converted to Christianity as a result, including the governor of Rome. My friends, there's no middle ground at the foot of the cross. No middle ground. Let us pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your message. Thank you for this. And I pray, Lord, 
that we would heed well what we have learned in Galatians, and that we would live our lives to glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen.